Okay. Um, my name's Anne Campbell. I work at Queen's up in the Switchwork Department. Um, for the last number of years before that, I worked at the uh, University of Ulster for about 10 years. Um, the ideas for this particular set of projects originated there. Um, a group of people who were interested primarily in online learning um, came together and um, there are a few different ideas which started off uh, in relation to um, reality, virtual, we call them virtual reality tools, we were online learning tools um, whereby students would take on the guise of uh, not an avatar, but they would be the social work student. Yes, did I see? Yes. But Belfast may have used this, this tool. Um, so we had two tools that were developed by myself, Emily Guinness and Susanna McCall at the University of Ulster, uh, and allowed the student to go into a, a mock up online environment whereby they would undertake an assessment. So they were met with this cartoon like environment. Um, and they would have to, they, they showed up in the car, you hear the car, you can't see the social work student, you hear the car, the social worker uh, student is controlling what's happening, it moves into the online environment, um, it's met with an outside environment which shows really sort of indicators typically, not always, but typically of that area of social economic deprivation and they have to sort of make decisions and observe, sorry, in the environment and record that in their on their form. The form they download is a Unicini form, the first one. Uh, then they make their way into the apartment building and go up three or four flights of stairs and again uh, showing signs of wear and tear. And then they move into the, you can imagine, a cartoon-like environment where my mum has a child and there's signs again of uh, that, that, that you would be wary of as a social work student going into a situation, they have to record their interpretation of those signs. And then they are back at the office and they chat with the online supervisor. They download, as I say, the, the unit chain form that accompanies that virtual environment for discussion purposes only because it was to provide a safe environment for students in order for them to be able to think about the information that was required whilst undertaking this before we let them miss uh, in placement. So they could make as many mistakes as they liked really. And the feedback from that was, was quite good. There was some glitches. The second one that we did in relation to that was an online learning tool which used NYSAT. And we had a different environment and that it was set uh, in an area that was not marked by socioeconomic deprivation. Um, and they looked at the value judgments around both the first one and that one also, what they felt about that. Um, and they were working with an older person with dementia. They moved into a household environment again, the online line environment, and they were shown indicators of um, that one safe, for example, there was a cooker ring left on, there was a pile of newspapers and letters on the kitchen table, the curtains hadn't been drawn, there was a musty smell in the house. Um, and they had to make that um, observation of these different indicators of what was happening within the household. And again, they downloaded a portion of the NYSAT nice assessment and should have brought that then back to the discussion on tutor group. So that took place over a period of a couple of years and we moved that to, uh, to other, um, other sites including Belfast Net and uh, Queen's as well and seems to have worked quite well so far. So from that, I had an idea, I had the idea about the virtual reality because we're looking at three young fellows playing um, different computer games and just been constantly sitting there with the, with the fingers and the buttons. I thought well, that would be a good way of transferring learning onto a screen or onto a medium that younger people were more familiar with and it seemed to work. The app idea came from a number of different sources. Uh, Triggered primarily the fact that you see students, you look down, the heads are down, you shouldn't go in the bed, invariably, if you're born in the life out of them. Um, you see people moving to their phones and uh, looking at a couple of ex students here who never did that, but might say, no. So, I think, well, there, there are mediums here, there are vehicles of learning here that we're not using, we're not keeping up with the program. Um, and Death by PowerPoint, 
check it with you, your, your, your method and your style of teaching, as well as looking at Demden teaching tools to try to keep up with what's happening. And that's where that came from. So, over the past few years, we have developed a number of apps. Child development app. Now, you can you could maybe take a wee second as I talk and download the child development app. These are all free apps. Um, and if you type into, I'm an Android woman, I can't, I'm not a great iOS Apple fan. Uh, you can download it via um, the Apple Store, you call Apple Store? Yeah. Apple Store. Apple Store. And for Android, it's Play Store. And just type in child development, not to six, and type in either NISC or Learning Pool beside it. Those were the developers and bring you up the app. And uh, we're going to show you. You're going to take a moment to do that now. And those first three apps. Were developed in conjunction uh, with NISC. I took the lead on the partnership, brought people together, did all the groundwork in terms of evolving these partnerships and making sure that people were there to talk in those days when we when we came together with so many different ideas. So NISC was at the, was at the heart of the development model. Um, Geraldine Cunningham to begin with and Maria. Uh, who's integral to the whole process and, and Dave still is. Um, and Brenda and Maureen work as well. So there's a, there's a few people involved from this. As I say, they were sort of the cooks of the development of child, child development apps. We started off with an up to six years, uh, followed by the seven to 12 years again, which is also free to download, and the 13 to 18 years. As I say, they were, they were built around sort of in this framework. And then I moved on to look at drug and alcohol app for a specific reason, i.e. there was a gap in the knowledge base of our social workers coming into practice. Um, and a couple of lectures in a very, very heavily packed undergraduate degree doesn't afford you the time to, for people like me to get the information across in relation to drugs and alcohol. So that was very much a self-indulgent app, because I felt that that was really important information to get out to our social work students. And then followed by a service user app, which is more interactive, and we'll come on to talk about how that project's going uh, at the end of this presentation. So, the rationale, as I say, began with looking at students and thinking how the students react to this app, and then thinking about how practic practitioners as well would use that app within, within practice. But it did begin originally as a student-oriented, student-focused uh, project. So, we thought about the gaps in teaching, and there were gaps in teaching in relation to child development. And I was reminded by Mary McCollum when she was my tutor, and then I taught with Mary on a wonderful, a wonderful privilege to do it, on a wonderful module called Child Observation, which was based on the Tavistock model, where our students went out into different placements and simply sat and observed the child for a couple of hours per week, and then went outside and had written down as many notes as possible to recall the information. So we don't have that anymore, unfortunately. Uh, we do have some, we do have some relevant teaching in relation to child development, but we wanted something that was easily accessible, compact, and easily usable uh, by people, and also to house the right information. So from that, we thought, well, the people to do that, we have our ideas about how that information should be formulated, how it should come together, much useful. But really, it's the people in the field, it's the AYEs, it's the students. It's the service users. Those are the people we have may have, may have our set of ideas uh, in terms of what we think people should know or need to know, and it may contradict the realistic picture of what people want to know. So the rationale came from a few different avenues of thinking and of ways of, of consideration of this app development for the child development apps. So that led on then to the process of consultation. And it was a multi-level, as I said there, a multi-faceted process. Um, and we talked to students on social work placement. We talked to qualified social workers. I have one memory of going out to Fatim and Straban um, and been met with a wee bit of incredulity and a wee bit of... Mm. And then as we talked through the process and the ideas that were coming and that sort of reciprocal um, working relationship and the ideas that came from that team. And we went to a number of teams, but that stuck out in my head specifically because of the original, not so sure about this, to we can see how, how this will work in practice, uh, which was a lesson learned for me. And it was about <coughs> giving people the ownership of the content of the app, it was their ideas, 
that were formulated and came from practice that would then inform people who were coming behind. Now, from that we formed a, an expert study group and they were indeed experts in relation to, because my field is not to development, uh, I was in the common study group, which was involved with the author with myself on the child development apps. So we drew from the expertise and knowledge of a number of different people from early years, from uh, youth justice, from uh, child care, from social work. Any others you think of from right now? The department. The department as well, yeah. Um, so we had a number of people around the table who came with their own aspect and their own way of looking at child development and how then it could be brought together and to present that information that would be appealed to different members of that multidisciplinary framework or environment that, that we all work within. So it wouldn't be seen as siloed information simply just for social workers. But nonetheless, the, the focus was on that social work um, aspect of, of learning. So backed up by NIST for funding and for practical, pragmatic and wonderful support all the way. It's great. It's a great, it was a great um, example of working in partnership um, because you felt everybody around the table had something important to say and it was always listened to. Uh, maybe not, not taken on board some of the time, but it was always listened to and discussed and the pros and cons of those separate pieces of information and how they should feed in there. So it was a great, it was a great experience in terms of learning for us as well. So I suppose as a state, if, if you're thinking about developing apps, my point I suppose from that is what you think people should know has invariably for me differed from what they think they should, they want to know. So having that steering group is such an important part of the process. So we had them from the beginning, from the idea development stage right through to the, to, to the end of the continuum, <coughs> and to the product development, and indeed the rollout and the evaluation. So it's having people there from the beginning to influence and to, to lend credence to your own ideas, which was a great validation for us. So in that sense then it best reflected the views of the people, as I say, who would use it rather than us who thought we could create a repository of knowledge which we thought might be the best fit for learning and practice. So the first step, compartmentalise the information under a number of sections including developmental milestones, which can be <coughs> You're doing things about technology. Oh, oh, it works. No. Okay, so when you go on to Play Store or iTunes or whatever you call it, Apple Store, this comes up uh, as a snapshot of, of of what the app looks like. Whatever you can download is just sitting there as well. I'm just going to go back into this successfully. Yeah. Can so, I just ask, is there a Wi Fi network in the room? Sorry. No, you need three oh, G's. Right. It was too complicated to get the Wi Fi up in the room, wasn't it? So. Okay, so not to six, we had the, the, it all came from I suppose the development of milestones and I was trying to get that information of you, I'm going to show you in a moment um, what it looks like. Uh, I'm trying to get that sense of what's important, what's going to draw people into the page, what's the soundbite information and the decriers of that would say you're adding to this whole soundbite nation, you're not allowing people to reflect upon the, the knowledge base and the evidence, you're just firing them a bit of knowledge and ticking the box, and we thought, well, it's not about that, but we have to draw people in in some way. We have to give that sense of, I need to read this, and following on from that, I need to look at the links at the bottom of each page to reflect further and download the reading, which we put on the app. So, for example, you've been to, um, uh, to which you're in a moment, one of the, the sections in relation to development in Mary Stones. Um, you could scroll right down the bottom of that page and then download off server, um, different pieces of academic reference material and other documentation that would then help you um, to reflect on your case or reflect on your essay or whatever. But we had to draw people in with some, some sound bite, splash, page information to begin with. Uh, we had theory, uh, which was much discussed as to what to put in and what to leave out. Again, legislation, which can appear very dry on the map because you're, you're, you're clicking on, on you know, just rings and rings of notes but um, 
Again, we try to keep that as sparse as possible on those sign back pages and direct people then to the to the documents that they can choose. So you're not you're picking and choosing what you need to know at that certain juncture in time, really. So so it's not to overload people. And then that all led to the reflection on a series of case studies that Mary McCulgan and others uh, had penned. And this was then sort of the amalgamation of all the material that they had looked at before, or what they had picked and chosen before, and then they could work their way through a case study scenario. The second app used a similar format, but we also added models of residential time care, including the sanctuary and map and um, social pedagogy in the Belfast Trust, so people could look at the different models of residential time care across one room. I particularly like the last one, even though it's had the first <coughs> downloads, the first one has just went through the roof. The last one for me was probably in terms of technical development, um, was the one that housed information in a way that to me was most easily accessible. And because you think the first app, the developmental milestones are compartmentalised every few months, um, from 0 to 3 and 3 to 6 and 6 to 12 and then 1 to 2 and so on. With the adolescent milestones, you'd sort of reached that plateau and there were not so many um, differentiations according to age, so it was, it was quite lumped together in terms of milestones. But the, in, in, on the other side of the coin, there was more information in relation to issues that were pertaining to um, mental health, substance use, suicide, bullying, sex, sexual relations that were important for practitioners and students to know about, all backed up with peer-reviewed material. Um, okay. This is a splash page of the <coughs> 10 to 12. So, before, before we, we came together as well, before we started the process, and during the process and after the process actually, we thought about, well, what's useful? Milestones came out on top, and indeed that has sort of come through as the page that is downloaded uh, on the, the, the most occasions. Because the linking of milestones, not just had it within its own sort of separate bubble, bubble but the linking of milestones to child protection. People wanted the information to be clear and brief, and as I say, links to more detailed documents and further reading if somebody wished to do so. Because you're waiting through legislation and policy, um, which is quite, it can be quite sort of an onerous task. Then yeah, I was trying to give the legislation and policy again that was most applicable to what you were doing, so you could pick and choose, as they say. And quick links to the most commonly used child development theory. Those were the main sort of elements of what people wanted to see. When we asked them how did you use them back and asked them how did you use this in practice and it tallied on both occasions so they could use it for quick referencing in practice and then supplement their reading at a later stage with the writing reports or assessments or indeed essays or uh, AYE material and the one at the bottom come out quite well. We didn't envisage that parents would would download the app. It was primarily aimed at the <coughs> practitioners, AYH uh, student social workers, and um, workers from other allied healthcare professions. But we've had quite a few downloads and reviews from parents. We find it also accessible and easy to read, which was a nice um, reflection on what we have done. Um, so AYEs again wanted to see a brief summary of the major theorists and they wanted to see typical development mental milestones. Now as well as seeing the information on screen in typeset and the links to the references, we thought that people are visual learners as well so we added a series of videos <coughs> in relation to typical and atypical development. Um, and there's a strong call, I think AYEs coming out of college for evidence-based knowledge so we spent quite a lot of time sifting through um, waves and waves of dross really, trying to get something online that was peer reviewed, that was from a reliable source, that we could stand over as an academic piece 
We didn't always get it, but we, we tried for, for weeks in order to, to download that. The downside of that was a lot of the information came from the US, um, and we thought that would be quite transferable to the UK context, so we, we, we laboured over that quite intensely about what we should include and what we shouldn't include in terms of the video component. It's up for review, there are a few links broken at the moment, but it's up for a major overhaul, right, isn't it, in the next, in the next few months, so there will be long term artists that don't work anymore. And that's one of the things about app development, you have to keep it up to date and in the moment, because if somebody goes on and taps on the information that's not there, you lose them, they're not going to come back again, so um, it's default, that's one of the downfalls. So, Moving on from that, this, this, the child development apps were developed over a few years. Um, Ray, do you want to see some of where we're at at the moment? Because yeah. I, I think this is interesting. Look, I'm not doing it justice because you, you're the main sort of proponent of this next bit. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Maria Tarkin from this here. Um, I'm responsible for the development of all these apps. Not too sure that's a good thing or not, with all the technology constantly changing on us. Um, in terms of the understanding of child development apps that our uh, fans been talking to you about at the moment, we're now proposing a complete redevelopment. And we're proposing to take the three apps and merge them into a single app. And then in doing that, fix all the links that are broken and um, bring it up to date. Um, because that app was developed in, the last one was developed in 2015. Uh -huh. yeah, we launched it with June 2015. So between 2013 and 2015 was when we developed those three apps. So we're looking at merging them all together into a single app. But some of the thinking behind that is it's just maintaining these apps is quite difficulty, difficult and keeping up to date with the changes in software, particularly with the iOS version. As we all know, if anybody uses an iPhone or an iPad, they're constantly being updated. So keeping ahead of all that's difficult. But we also was thinking that as part of doing that, um, we've got quite a lot of interest from pretty or not to six app. It went worldwide. with something like 199 countries at the moment have downloaded it. So it's gone quite beyond the scope that we ever imagined for that app. And we've got interest now from other countries outside of Northern Ireland who are very interested in the app and like the app but would like to make the policy and legislation um, part specific to their country. So we've a number of maybe five to seven partners kind of expressing interest in those that the app. So part of the redevelopment <coughs> would be at bringing in those partners and adding in sort of regional specific sections around policy and legislation. The rest of the content will more or less stay yeah. with the one. You see, um, some tweaks there and bringing it up to date, but that's one of the biggest things we're planning to do. Um, we're talking maybe about adding some maybe new features like uh, <coughs> call notes, maybe a um, checklist to help, help users when they're out to give them you know, some, uh, something to work with. So something a wee bit more like that, inter interactive and more relevant for practitioners. And we've been doing some work with the FIT teams. Yeah. Um, Anne's been out talking to them about that to see what would really be useful for them. So that's where we're going. So we're, it's, we're at the start of this piece of development. Hopefully it will be done and completed by next September. So it's, it's an ongoing progress, progress at the moment. We're just trying to get our developer tendered at the moment and bring all our partners on board. So that's where we're thinking of going. Okay, thank you, Ryan. So in relation to the drug and alcohol app, um, that was funded from <coughs> the PHA and it came from an idea, as I say, around the fact that maybe um, our undergraduates, we did some of our postgraduates, do not have the relevant information in relation to drugs and alcohol. Um, and it's backed up with the research that says, you know, that some of the, not, not even just working in substance use and addictions, um, in the voluntary sector and the statutory sector, that's specialised work, but across all parts of social work, working with older people, working with their own disability, working with probation, um, working with um, family child care, bringing their work work from Devani at all. 63% of case management reviews and problems associated with drug and alcohol issues. So we see it across all areas of social work. Um, and Galvani, who has written widely on the social work value base, we're working with, a, working with substance use and substance use disorders. Um, in a recent study she's, had, she's done one since then, actually, highlighted the social work practitioners are not equipped to address 
um, areas of substance use in all sectors of practice. So we thought we had a good rationale and a good starting point for the development of one within Northern Ireland. Uh, again, this was a great partnership project because we brought service users together who are part of the Drug and Alcohol Service User Network in Northern Ireland and BB uh, in Belfast, which is a, a, a voice for service users in drug and alcohol. And they are ahead of the game, I think, in terms of service user involvement from the ground up. So they were very instrumental in influencing the content of the app around the change in nature of drugs um, and how we important things like MPS and what was not, what was then legal highs, but of course are banned substances under the, the MPS Act 2016. So this one is a bit more of a challenge because trying to update it constantly can be quite trying. We have a meeting next week because a lot of the stuff has fallen off the shelf, the radar. A lot of drugs have been added, a lot of drugs will be taken away. So yeah, that, that was a wee bit more challenging. But nevertheless, a great, again, a great venture to be involved in because the expert steering group kept, kept us grounded in terms of the views from the practitioners from the policy makers and managers, the senior and junior people working on the ground, the drug outreach workers, people in homeless support, uh, a wide range of people who had great input into the development of this app and service user input, which was invaluable because they know more about what's happening on the ground than the practitioners do. So we thought that was a very important part of, of what we were doing. And that's just a splash page in relation to that. I'm going to show you in a moment. So, from the development of those apps, what have we learned? What, what did we learn? Um, what's not up there, I'm, I was talking to the medics about this over in, over in the uh, Nelson factory the other day in relation to doing education apps. Um, and one of the guys put his hand up and says, well, what if just do, do it yourself app online? It doesn't, they're not great. And one of the other women in the audience said she had approached master students at Queen's and you know, that was going to take a year and a half to get up and running. We were very fortunate to work with a young graduate company um, it wasn't very, it wasn't, it was expensive to begin with, but, but it has become less expensive, would you say, we're red, engaged, well, yeah, dirty yeah. Side. yeah. So, I think one of the big things for us was, a second one there, getting a good developer company, you could get a half day someone now for, or for under 5,000 pounds, couldn't you? And then use that template for others. If you go to, uh, students to do it, it takes up to 18 months and it's been reported anecdotally, to quote me on this, that the quality isn't as good. If you do it, do it yourself, app online, again people are saying they're not getting that level of um, authenticity or the level of professionalism that they need for, for practitioners in practice. I haven't done it so I can't comment on it. Partnership is a key element um, across all the groupings that I just mentioned. And the developers should be in there from the beginning. They're not the people who just come down and stick it up all online for you. If there's a clear integrated partnership, then it's almost, there's nuances and there's ways of looking at things that the developers and their people began to pick up about how social workers start thinking about things. And they come up with ideas, so that was a wonderful way of working, rather than getting some guys in at the end, uh, a woman in at the end just to stick it on an app. Um, the way that we did it, I thought was much better. Um, important to have a scoping exercise at the beginning to establish your target audience. Who's it going out to? Who are you trying to target? So therefore then you can tailor and adapt the content in order to reach your market and get them coming back again. Make use of your expert steering group. There will be disagreement. There will be the everything with the kitchen sink approach at the beginning and it's about you trying to sort of shepherd that and, and trying to funnel down the information that everybody agrees upon has been important parts of, of the app uh, and you can't throw everything in otherwise you have just something too big and unwieldy to, to put on your phone. So that was the lesson I learned. Um, also, um, the content management system, I we didn't do it originally in the child development app, so this is where you have control of your what comes up on the screen. So if I type and a drug a drug comes up, a drug a drug came up there, there was a few overdoses last week and there was a new strain of something mixed with Lyriga or Pregabalin and it was causing um, fitting or overdosing or whatever. So we can take that directly onto the app and say this is what's happening at the moment. I can just type it onto my computer via Word document and it uploads to the app and that's called a content management system. And we're doing the same now with child development apps as, uh, as uh, we get a new way of working with that. 
<coughs> the second one, the, the promotion campaign, I couldn't believe the numbers. I'll just go quickly with that actually. The numbers that were being downloaded. Um, we had, now these are old numbers, 80,000 80, people, that's not downloads, 80,000 people that could have, there were separate downloads at that stage. Um, and those numbers I think have increased again, we're on about 87,000 across the world for the 0 to 6. The drugs app, I just phoned in this morning, we've another 6, we've about 16,000 using that, or have used that. Um, and 7 to 12 hasn't really sort of taken off in the way that the 0 to 6. I was talking to the medics about this the other day, and said everybody wants to know about that developmental stage. It's important for health visitors, it's important for nurses, it's important for social workers. There seems to be more of a, a, a a feeling of our thirst of knowledge, not thirst for knowledge, but the knowledge compartmentalised in a way that people can access for the 0 to 6 primarily. Um, it's funny, on that one there, you can see, you probably can't see, but at the top, the, the most downloads in terms of sessions and screen views in the United States, followed by the UK, and then India. And one of the, the criticisms from um, someone who's not here at the moment, but I agree with them completely, was how can you take that sort of Western view of child development and uh, place it within that non-Western context? That uh, was a very good point and well made, but we haven't really, we're, we're think, we are moving towards looking at more culturally competent ways of including that information in this new suite of apps, but nevertheless, the downloads are happening in places like India and the Philippines and Malaysia and Turkey and and so on. So, I don't know why that's happening. It's something we need to look at, I think. What else? Yeah, undertake a formal evaluation alongside the monitoring of the analytical data. Well, Google Analytics is wonderful. Those were the numbers that I just threw up there to ensure that the amendments are made according to the needs of app users. So, in the drugs ones, it's easy. Drugs fall off, we get rid of them. Um, the one that we, we find least appealing in the drug one is the theory. Nobody wants to know the theory of the drug and alcohol use. I think the one we find uh, equally least um, um, appealing is the legislation and policy and child development apps. If we look at the Google Analytics, people want the milestones, and people like the case studies, um, and people like the theory and the, and the child development app. So I suppose what I'm trying to say is go back and revisit who's downloading what, how long they're staying on the screen for, which you can do via Google an Analytics. And then that can lead you to amend and keep the app fresh because the thing with apps is they date very easily. I'll just finish on a bit of time. We have now moved on to developing a service user app um, for uh, evaluation purposes, and this was a pilot study, which is, is a pilot study. And the four sites we've here we have um, East Midlands, Birmingham. Birmingham, I can't remember the name of the council area. Sandwa, uh, Stirling and Aberdeen. East Midlands is working with uh, their version of Fit Teams. Um, Northern Ireland started off with um, uh, gateway teams and that didn't quite work. And then a Fit Team and now we've moved on to adult services in the Western Trust as well. Uh, Stirling and Aberdeen owns a drug and alcohol service for social workers. Our gathering feedback and Aberdeen is a um, and child care service also. So what happens is that we have an app that's downloadable and we compiled 10 questions and that took months to get the, the wording just right because a lot of social workers weren't happy and others were and others weren't. So we were trying to get a general sense of what we should include in those 10 questions and it's essentially about feedback. So social worker hands the iPad or the phone and ask the person to give a Likert style response to how they felt the interaction or the series of interactions had taken place. All that information is out back to me and I look at trends and what people are satisfied with according to region rather than looking at what the single social worker gets. That was very important for ethical approval so we wouldn't be using it as a, a tool to target certain individuals, just looking at trends in terms of feedback. Um, so that's been analysed at the moment and the report will be due in the spring. And we're hoping to move that on from family and child care, drugs and alcohol to other, other areas. The, the initial feedback we're getting from practitioners is that it's easy to use and it's better than the paper-based version. Um, because we're looking at it as a vehicle for gathering information rather than 
the act of gathering information, if you know what I mean. So, yeah, that seems to be going well, and we want to report back on that in the spring. So those are, those apps are available, as I say, on iTunes and um, on Play Store. You just type in child development, or Broken Alcohol, Northern Ireland. You can download the service user feedback app, but you're not able to use it because there's a pin number that you need. <coughs> because we have to exclude people who are not using it directly for service provision. Um, oh yeah, and I was going to show you a taster. They have enough time. Enough time? Yeah? yeah. Okay. And people have seen the child development app before, I think. Most people in the room have seen it before, yeah? Yeah. Okay, so I'm just going to show you the drug and alcohol one. Um, come up with me. And it's the same premise as the... Oh, I'm going to get up to so there all day. So, with an introduction to the app, there should be a picture coming up there, but it's not. We ask people to register for email to update service and also to track the usage as well. We give them a flavour of the context of drugs and alcohol. Um, we have statistics, statistical documentation that's updated. I'm afraid to go into it in case it takes me out of the app and can't get back in again. We have a wonderful drug directory that we change and update. Um, this is where we work with our service users. And with the scientific terms for benzos, and street names, the effects, the method of usage, the health risk, um, and then some 10 street facts or facts, <coughs> facts about benzos that people seem to like. Um, so we have that across a number of drugs and that, that changes um, quite regularly, particularly in relation to MPS and the fluid nature of that market or that um, compilation of different drugs within that market. Uh, we also have the theories. We have very important that social workers um, and other workers, uh, I think the value base within drug and alcohol working is changing and people are more, because of the harm reduction techniques used, people are more open to learning more about the value base that underpins healthcare workers we find and nurses and um, drug and alcohol outreach workers are thinking more about the values and that was great for us to have some, not influence, but to have some input into that change in direction in thinking. So, that was um, mostly from the work of Gal Valley, who I think is absolutely brilliant. So then we give a series of um, explanations of different models that people would be using and theories. And again, we have a, a series of links at the bottom so people can download at their leisure. Uh, right through MI, recovery, CBT, relapse prevention, harm reduction legislation and policy which people avoid um, and then a section on something that's close to my own heart, dual diagnosis and then a section on working with specialist groups so it goes on and on and on. People can choose and take from this menu and add it to their favourites uh, box and the one that I like most is this one. So service user or practitioner, <coughs> we have an alphabetized list of services, boundary and statutory across Northern Ireland so people can type in addiction NI get the address, um, get the phone number and call, um, tells you the age range, the access referral areas covered, the trust, the services available. Uh, there's an email address there and if people are looking for directions then they can GPS it. So Addiction and I is another bridge road, we're looking 10 minutes from here, probably not enough traffic but and it gives you the, as it would in your phone, the, the, the actual maps that would give you whatever loads, how to actually get there. So, people seem to be using that quite well. So, that's just a, an overview of um, where we're at in terms of app development. And I know other people, I know, I think Probation launched an app as well, which is very good. Um, and there are other people who are using apps. There's a Brilliant apps for working with autism that was developed by Carola Dillenberger up at, in our department as well. Um, but she runs the Applied Behavioural Analysis Program under education. So, yes, that is uh, the overview. Thank you very much. And if anybody wants to ask you any questions, you're very welcome. Yes? I have loads of questions. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I could talk to you all day. Um, I'm Head of Communications and Probation, and as you said, we just launched our app this year. Yeah. Um, and it's been 
learning from start to, to finish. We um, <coughs> had made a bid for some money um, in the last financial year to do a <coughs> work we've been trying to do it for some time and because of resources. Um, we only found out we were getting it, um, the money, at the beginning of March and it needed to be spent by the yeah. end of March, yeah. um, which um, gave us a really tight time frame. And Pauline is with me today as part of our expert group that we brought together very quickly, went out to tender and um, got a, a company to, to work with us. And what we did initially was very, very simple mm -hmm. and very low cost. And this was one of the things that we've, we've they've been good and bad points of the journey. And the good points are we've actually done something which is great, um, and we've got ourselves out there. It's been picked up really well in Europe by um, the Confederation of European Probation, who yeah. paid yeah. for me to go out in October to Romania and talk about it because it really wasn't very much within probation in Europe, um, you know, had, had been developed. And as a result of that, we now have an expert European working group who are coming to Northern Ireland next year, going to Sweden and some other places, and with the aim of looking at CBD programs that we can now try and develop using an app. But the learning for us and some of the difficulties for us have been um, there was the cost issue. It was, you know, when, when I went to Europe and saw the, the small bits of work that were being done, I mean, our app was done for under 15 grand. Yeah. And yeah. Um, when we went to Europe, they were coming, like, they had 16, 70,000 pounds to spend on app development. Um, so we were very limited in terms of what we could do. We had to make the best use of money. Trying to get the downloads. I mean, when I see some of the numbers that you have up there, I mean, ours is more specialised, but we are struggling to get people to download it, and we really need to think a bit more about that. Um, and ours is a service user app in the main, but it's also a really good resource for anybody interested in probation. Yeah. Um, so we are really going to have to concentrate in the next number of months um, around <coughs> how we can get more people to, to try and download it. Yeah. Um, the other thing has been service users. We really, at the, at the outset, because we were under such time constraints, couldn't bring service users into the process. So we started in April and then started a big process with you know showing it to service users and getting them part of the next phase of development, which we have just, um, actually it's just been updated now, and it's been updated with um, the, you know, the, the views and the comments that service users have given us. They, they wanted a calendar functionality put into it so they could put their appointments in. Yeah. They, wanted some, they wanted animation instead of um, words to explain yeah. what we did. So we took on board everything they said, but that, the value in the service user thing for us yeah. has been something <coughs> that we just, um, we couldn't have done within the time frame, just in those, that initial month. But it's something that um, absolutely, like, just as key to the success of this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We find that as well because um, initially we didn't approach the, the drug and alcohol service user group um, and we went ahead and then it was more or less finished. They were there at the start but the input wasn't the way that we wanted it or they wanted it and then we just stopped for a couple of months thought, right, what do you think of that? We went through it piece by piece and the, the added value from that exercise and the continuing exercises uh, of involvement with them has just it's, it transformed uh, some of the content completely and made it more accessible. In terms of your cost, I know you're saying, you know, it, I mean, is it in that sort of both yeah. part yeah. that we're talking about? Yeah. It's not the higher end? No, no, we did the yeah. drug and alcohol one for 10 right. and it is quite, it's quite detailed and it has quite a lot of information with the interactive bit in there as well the GPS. I mean, do you want to say something about the cost for the other ones? It varies, like what they would have been, but the Actually, those costs were quite under because the developer we worked with hadn't done. We were just kind of new to everybody. We were, we were just kind of like a, we were guinea pigs for both of us. So when we started our child development, that was our first staff, and it was the first staff that the developer had done as well. So cost days were probably lower than. Well, okay. It varies. Like it, it actually depends on your developer and how complex you want to make your app. Yeah. If you, you can do something quite, you know, it depends how. You, Simplistic or interactive, you want to make it, and then that adds to your cost. Yeah. As you add more to it. Yeah. The interaction okay. now definitely adds to the cost. We're looking at one to do with drugs and alcohol and a follow up program online with people using apps. And we're looking at one the mental health services are thinking <coughs> about um, tracking is the wrong word, but keeping um, keeping the communication up with people. Um, and following people up and making sure so there's a, a traffic light system if the assessment hasn't been done or if they are putting on weight, which is a huge problem with, with antipsychotics, then there, there's a tracking system there. So we're looking at that sort of interaction, but we're, we're talking 30, 
£40,000 for that sort of thing, whereas information-based apps, uh, we got ours for 10000 we yeah. paid 15 I think. And in the service user app, the feedback app, we got four, four and a half thousand. So, because that's just 10 questions after yeah. yeah. So right, we developed an app um, with foster carers, and it's all about keeping children safe online in our trust, South Eastern Trust. Right, yeah. um, so it's just basically, it's a knowledge based app with different modules in it, but it's also got a testing capacity yeah. to it. So they do a test and it issues them a certificate. Oh. And so we're going to do two or three tests a year on it as well. Uh -huh. oh. uh, for ease of access for foster carers to find it so difficult to get out to training. Yeah. Um, and the feedback's been fantastic oh. on it. They've loved it. There's a resource section too that we put our newsletters on, our training booklets. Um, the other thing we have is a notification. Yeah. Um, so we send it out, ping them out um, notifications, which is great. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it's now going to be taken up Northern Ireland wide. So all the trusts have bought, bought, bought into it. We're going to be paying an annual licence, sorry, as well. So the company is the unique group. They've done uh, work with uh, London social workers and they have a background mm. in creating apps. Um, so they're going to keep it updated every year yeah. with all the technology because it changes so fast. Yeah. Would it be possible to roll it up to um, private agencies? I work for Action for Children, which is a voluntary yeah. fostering agency. Yeah. And that is exactly the kind of thing that yeah. is going to ask how can we develop that kind of resource because these child development apps are really glad I came today because foster carers really need these kinds yeah. of resources. Yeah. Um, within but, our area of work it's yeah. quite difficult for them to distinguish between what is normal development mm -hmm. behaviours and what is trauma behaviour. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what the scope, would that be any scope for example for and around attachment issues or around trauma and development. I don't know what this But the way that it works for us, each of the trust paid mm -hmm. license. Mm -hmm. um, the Regional Foster and Adoption Agency is actually paying for all the trusts at the moment, and the Health Minister is launching it on Safer Internet Day. Um, so if a private agency wanted to buy the licenses off the company, there should be no problem. Mm -hmm. and what, why do you need a license mm -hmm. then? Because the company's going to keep it updated because the platforms, what it does, it covers all the social media platforms that the young people are using, which change so much and we wouldn't have the okay. staff to keep yeah. that real and keep that updated. Is that, is that a year, can I ask you, is that an annual fee that you pay? It's, uh, it? We went into a three year contract that and for all that? five trusts it's like three and a half thousand and that's all the maintenance and all the updates. And it also links them in. <laughs> yeah, it also links them in um, to a reporting. The company have their own um, like help desk. So, say if a foster care went on and we don't have the most up to date thing on, they can ping in and say I'm really concerned about this. And then one of the guys will come back to them with an update. Is this a London based company? No, Belfast. <laughs> Jim Gamble used to be the head of SEAP. And I'll give you the details afterwards. But um, they've also developed one for Sports NI. Oh. As well, and what's happened. Um, but the feedback, the foster cars were involved from the very beginning. Yeah. I had user groups going all the time, and the feedback's been excellent from it. And um, the tests good. they're doing has oh. been really good. Excellent. Um, so, so far, so good. Really nice. Excellent. So, it's nice that it's now all trusts are going to have it. So, the theory behind it is also all foster cars in Northern Ireland will have access to that. They each have their own unique username mm -hmm. and password mm -hmm. to go into the content. To hear about these different yeah. things that are going on. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, no, I was just going to ask um, with responsive uh, mobile friendly web development now, kind of <coughs> websites getting more kind of like apps and their functionality, yeah. did you consider going down the web development route, which would have been cheaper um, as opposed to developing apps? Yes. Do you want to answer that, Ryan? We, we're, we're, we're looking at that for, we have other apps. Mm -hmm. Outside of our child development app, we have a Down Silver Care Toolkit app, and we have an app for registered child minders. You may have seen that. Yeah. So we are looking for the long term. We're looking at moving them over into more like an adaptive, responsive type, mm -hmm. so you can access it from any device. Mm -hmm. And as you say, when you download it onto your uh, mobile phone, it'll look like an app. So mm -hmm. we're we're starting to move that way. We haven't. We may in the future with the child development. We don't know. We're looking at combining that. There are. Our focus at the moment is bringing the three apps together yes. into one yes. and, and taking that forward still as a mobile app. But we'll see as we move down because, as you say, maintaining those. And, mm -hmm. and as the technology is changing so fast now, so 
that technology is really catching up now, so I think that responsive type of um, technology is really where uh -huh. things are moving to. Yeah, people still like <coughs> on the app on the phone. Yeah. That's that's the, that is the bit we had to balance, yeah. and for yeah. our child development, um, our app, the majority of the content sits on your app, and mm -hmm. you only have to go to an uh, internet connection for your further links. Yeah. Some of that adaptive, yeah. responsive, you require yeah. a, yes. a, a link, a, a connect to be connected to the internet from the outset, yes. and it's about. You have to look at your, your actual target group and what's the most useful to them. And I think that's key to all your apps and in ter terms of promoting it. It's where your target audience is and how can you access them. Yeah. We're ready to release our web-based version, but for foster curses, because some of them don't all have smartphones or tablets. Or, so we are doing a web-based yeah. version yeah. that's coming out within the next month, but that's because of the target group.